This is Rory Spiegel and Ryan Radecki, and this is the Annals of Emergency Medicine podcast. It is April 2021. We're back again for another great month. Ryan, how you doing? Doing great, Rory. <laughs> yeah. We laugh because we're recording two months at the same time. And so, uh, yeah, we just caught up all on the March episode, and so we have nothing more to say to each other, really. So why don't we just hop right in? But we should jump in like we did last time. All right, let's do it. All right, so our first article, Lung Ultrasonography for the Diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 Pneumonia in the Emergency Department. And the lead author is Emmanuel Pavetti. If you have a problem in the emergency department, it will not be long before someone offers up ultrasound as a potential solution. And so it's not surprising that lung ultrasound is being examined as a potential diagnostic modality to assist in the diagnosis of COVID. We know a rapid test are not ideal. Neither is chest x-ray. CT, while fairly sensitive for lung disease, is impractical to use in most patients presenting to the ED with symptoms concerning for COVID. So ultrasound is a natural solution. These authors conducted a prospective study enrolling consecutive adult patients with symptoms potentially related to SARS-CoV-2 infection who were admitted to the emergency department in an Italian academic hospital. Immediately after their initial assessment, an ultrasonographic evaluation was performed and the likelihood of COVID was assessed based on both the clinical assessment and the lung ultrasound findings. The authors enrolled patients between April 1st and April 20th, 2020, and they enrolled a total of 228 patients over that time. And what they found was lung ultrasound was fairly sensitive and specific for diagnosing COVID. Clinical assessment, on the other hand, was not so good. It had an 81% sensitivity and a 63% specificity. And this was compared to PCR diagnosis of COVID during their hospitalization. So not their first one, but their downstream one that was eventually positive. Lung ultrasound, on the other hand, performed quite well with 94.4% sensitivity and 95% specificity. And this was compared to initial PCR testing done in the emergency department, which was only 80% sensitive, though it was 100% specific. And that's really because, you know, a, a positive PCR was defined as the gold standard. So you couldn't actually decide that there were any false positives based on the PCR, because if you were PCR positive, you were considered to have COVID. So, I mean, I think this is a fairly well done study and fairly positive for ultrasound. I, I do wonder why clinical evaluation alone was not so good as, you know, in my experience, COVID is fairly obvious to diagnose. And in the heart of the, the pandemic, uh, which I think this wasn't in Italy, everyone has COVID. <laughs> so I also wonder how clinically necessary it is to definitively diagnose COVID pneumonia at presentation if the presentation was subtle enough to be missed clinically, right? Because if you see someone, they have, you know, signs or symptoms concerning for COVID, but they're not hypoxemic, you can ambulate them, they don't desaturate, you're going to give them good return instructions, you're going to say you probably have COVID, the test will come back, it may or may not be positive, but you should isolate yourself, so on and so forth. If you get worse, come back. And if you do desaturate in the emergency department or require oxygen, you're going to get admitted and treated like you're COVID anyway. So I'm not sure how much more the ultrasound does in a diagnostic fashion, nor do I know, and this did state as assess, how it really helps us prognostically. Can the presence of B lines on ultrasound decide who is in, or, or is not likely to decompensate during their stay in the, in the hospital? Yeah, I think the key thing here, and we're probably going to hear this over the next year from us more than once, is that the, the publication dates received for publication July 7th, 2020, you know, accepted for publication October 6th, 2020. This this is a, a snapshot in time from you know six to six months to a, a year ago as far as you know the approach to diagnosing COVID when rapid tests were not as rapid and not as readily available and it seemed like ultrasound might be a valuable adjunct. So as we move forward in time and vaccines are pervasive and you know COVID finally pitters out, we hope. This is probably not going to be quite as relevant to a study, and we're probably going to see more COVID studies trickling through, and we'll look at them back fondly <laughs> and remember our time with COVID as we present them on the podcast. Yeah, I'm not sure how, how many of us are going to look back fondly on our time with COVID, but <laughs> speaking of someone who had it, <laughs> we did not look back on that time fondly. So, so here we are looking fondly back at last July when it was hard to diagnose COVID. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I, I, and I do think, you know, we should, we should think about how, not only how you diagnose it, because again, I don't think you have to diagnose it perfectly, be right or wrong. You have to have some general idea. You probably have COVID or you, you probably don't have COVID. 
and make sure you have good discharge instructions or, or, or good kind of follow-up instructions for the patient. And then just have some understanding of how do you identify the ones that are going to rapidly escalate their oxygen requirements. I, I think, you know, the data would suggest the best thing we have for that is, is the ambulatory SAT or, or just oxygen requirements in general. Patients who require o- oxygen are at high likelihood of decompensating rather quickly. Patients who desaturate when they ambulate, even if they have normal SATs at rest, are also at high likelihood of, of, of up titrating oxygen requirements fairly quickly. And those are the patients you should pay attention to. Whether or not you can diagnose them with an ultrasound, I'm not sure if it's as important. No, or, whether it's, or like you say, whether it's clinically superior to a different, more readily measurable you know, right. clinical feature. All right. So, so long, COVID. Hopefully by the time this uh, everybody's listening to this in April, COVID is, is really starting to look like so long, COVID. All right. So the next article here is called Predicting Progression to Septic Shock in the Emergency Department Using an Externally Generalizable Machine Learning Algorithm. Good old fashioned sepsis. We will we'll always have sepsis. <laughs> and machine learning. Sepsis and machine learning. It seems like uh, we will always have machine learning too. <laughs> lead author, Gabrielle Wardy, and they're at the University of California, San Diego. And as you're saying, every month it seems we are contractually obligated to do a machine learning prediction article. Luckily, in addition to emergency medicine, I, I, I do have a master's in health informatics, and I'm actually board certified in clinical informatics, and I'm actually an associate fellow of the Australasian Institute for Digital Health, so I, I can sort of read some of these papers. But we are approaching the margins of requiring a PhD for some of these, these pieces here, considering two of the authors are, in fact, PhDs. I think that's a fairly reasonable assessment. Regardless, qualifiers and caveats uh, you know, behind, this article describes this, these authors' work at creating a modified Weeble Cox proportional hazards model for the onset of septic shock in patients identified as having severe sepsis. So the whole point here is that these patients who you see with severe sepsis immediately, that's great. If you see them with severe sepsis, you kind of want to predict whether they're going to get worse. And usually the patients who are about to immediately get worse are obvious. So these are the ones that four hours after triage and further out in their hospital stay, they're trying to prognosticate which ones are going are most likely to get worse you know, to predict, you know, downstream potential resource requirements and unplanned escalations of care. So one of the things that you can use for this is a Weeble Cox model. And one of the things that they did to sort of add on to this uh, as part of their technique is that they had a second trained neural network on top of that that sort of amplifies these collinear features or specific combinations of features known to, uh, you know, affect risk. Sort of like how hypothermia, as they give an example, is a greater concerning feature in presentation in the elderly than perhaps in the young. There are substantial background methods and definitions to describe how they identified these patients retrospectively from the data sets from these two hospitals in their studies and having severe sepsis and how they met either the CMS definition or the sepsis 3 definitions. And then again, likewise, how they identified the onset of septic shock. Using 40 of the most commonly measured input variables and then 8,499 and 6,409 patients with severe sepsis from their two hospitals respectively, they plugged these features into their model to try and predict the you know, five odd percent who developed septic shock four hours after triage and within 48 hours after the development of severe sepsis. So the area under the curve of their model at their primary outcome, the 12-hour time point, was 0.822 on their training set, which them at the cut point that they defined was 65% specificity and 85% sensitivity. And this is fine. I mean, these are just numbers, you know, out of context and not specifically evaluated as part of clinical care. What is mildly more interesting in this article is their application of so-called transfer learning, which is basically a way of sneaking around overfitting on that derivation set for use on their validation set. Basically, if you want to generalize your model from one data set to another, it's a process in which the previous model can be sort of supplementarily retrained on the other data set if it's similar enough to your derivation set. And well, so they were able to do this and they were able to boost the uh, area under the curve on their validation set to match their training set. So everything here are really good ideas. This is important work for you know, advancing the state of machine learning and you know, generalizability of machine learning applications from one center to another because everybody can come up with some data set and some predictive model trained on their own institution. And this is a nice demonstration of how they were able to use their own model on a different model and sort of train it up so that it could be effective on the, the sparser data set. As we seem to 
discuss at the end of every machine learning article on here, we're a long ways from good ideas to actually improving and improving the value of the care and improving patient outcomes just by generating this predictive model. So step one, nice academic demonstration. Step two, put it into practice and see if we can actually improve outcomes. Yeah, I mean, you know, machine learning has been thought to be like the, the cure for sepsis for, for decades now, and yet, yet we, we still have not re- managed to reduce our mortality. I, I think we, we, we kind of said this uh, last month or two months ago when we discussed the machine learning algorithm for, for CHF, and just because you can predict if someone's going to do bad, it doesn't mean that, you know, admitting into the hospital for treatment of CHF is going to make a difference. And here is somewhat the same, you know, have, you've got a moderate sensitivity and specificity where you'll still miss a whole bunch of people and still overcall a lot. I mean, even if you are able to machine your way to a more accurate, you know, algorithm, that doesn't mean that if you identify those patients, you're going to be actually to change their outcome. And so I think, like you said, a lot has to be done before these things, one, we've got to make them better, right? They've got to be more sensitive, more specific before they can actually be clinically utilized. And two, They've got to show that, you know, if we identify these patients earlier, we actually can make a meaningful difference in outcomes. I mean, I'm not as excited about sensitivity, although, I mean, sensitivity is probably what sounds the most important to administrators because they don't want to miss the patient who actually deteriorates. But actually, I'm more worried about specificity, like you say, and the fact that you might be having atrogenic harms to a greater number of patients who are getting sort of low value care, as you say, either escalations of care or more frequent monitoring or prophylactic something against something that may or may not occur. I'm more worried about specificity because that's where you end up really reallocating the limited healthcare resources towards something that may or may not materialize. Right. That and the fact that, you know, almost every disease process ends in sepsis at some point, right? Like (laughs) a great deal of dying ends in sepsis. So we really have to be able to, you know, sparse out people who have a fixable disease or a fixable course with those that are at the end of life. And, and, you know, we should be moving towards more palliative and hospice kind of solutions. Very good. All right. Well, why don't we move on? Our next article is evaluating sepsis disparities in the emergency department management of patients with suspected acute coronary syndrome, and the lead author is Selena Prasada. It is well documented that there are significant discrepancies in the care depending on the patient's sex when presenting to the ED with symptoms concerning for ACS. Women are less likely to be admitted for hospitalization and revascularization and are less likely to be referred for coronary angiography when presenting to the emergency department for chest. These authors sought to determine if using a standardized risk score, the heart score in specific, was associated with a reduced in the sex disparities in the management of outcomes. They compared rates of 30-day stress testing and hospitalization, as well as acute myocardial infarction and all-cause death between men and women stratified by the heart score to describe sex differences in acute chest pain and the management of out- and outcomes. They conducted a retrospective analysis of data for all emergency departments at the Kaiser Permanente South California hospitals between May 20, 2016 and December 1, 2017. They included all patients greater than 18 whom the treating clinician had performed a heart score on. There was a total of 34,750 adult ED encounters with a documented heart score, which were included in this analysis. A little over 9,000 of these, 56%, were women. The median age of the population is 61%. Compared with men, women were more likely to be categorized as low risk, having a heart score of 1, 2, or 3, 60% versus 52%, and less likely to be categorized as high risk, having a score of 7 through 10, 2.8% versus 4.9%. They also report a difference in the 30-day stress testing and hospitalization between men and women. Clinicians referred more men for stress testing compared to women and discharged women more often from the emergency department. Overall, the adjusted odds for hospitalization or 30-day stress testing was significantly lower in women compared to men. The difference in acute myocardial function and all-cause mortality was also lower in women compared to their male counterparts. So all in all, I think this is a really nice study, though I don't think it truly assesses the heart score's effect on sexual discrepancies. For that, they would have to do a a before and after comparison that compared how men and women worked up prior to the implementation of the heart score and then after. But even with the heart score, there were definitely discrepancy here. Women in the low-risk group were less likely to be tested than men in the same category. 
Now, this might be beneficial because they're at less risk for overdiagnosis and overtreatment, but it nonetheless, it does represent a discrepancy. Yeah, it's a little interesting to see that there's such a discrepancy in our clinical practice, but I think that goes into our sort of our perception of sex differences between presentations and cardiac presentations. It's nice to see that we weren't harming anybody here, but I'm not sure exactly what the next steps might be. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And you can look at the discrepancies of the clinicians, right? Because you know, the, the heart score viewed that they were low, low risk, the, the men, but they were still admitted to the hospital versus their female counterpart. So the score might not have been the discrepancy. It might have been the clinicians themselves. On the other hand, you could say the score is inherently built in with discrepancies, you know, it, as you're using a, a single troponin value where we know that both men and women have a different cutoff for their uh, 99% threshold. And so even the score itself might have discrepancies. So it's not as objective as, as the authors may like. This is true. In theory, we'd be discharging more women regardless, considering the 99th percentile for women is a lower cutoff. And this has been described here on this podcast even before. Right. So there, there, there's in, inherent discrepancies built into the score that, you know, can't be accounted for in this study. Yes. And speaking of a score that actually has gender differences built into it, the EDAC score is our next article. The Diagnostic Accuracy of the Emergency Department Assessment of Chest Pain EDAC Score, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. The lead author here is Richard S. Boyle, and they are at the University of Manchester. And it's nice to see this score get a little bit of a day in the sun, because this is actually what we use here at Christchurch Hospital. And it's unsurprising that we use it, of course, considering it was created by one of my co-workers based on data collected here in Christchurch. So, of course we use it. Um, and so EDAX is just another member of the family of modern ED-centric prediction tools for early disposition of low-risk chest pain, such as HEART, which we are extremely familiar with now, or something like the Manchester Acute Coronary Syndrome's decision aid. This meta-analysis looks at nine studies evaluating the performance characteristics of the algorithm, three of which are the original derivation and validation studies. Pooled together using 11,578 patients, at its dichotomous cutoff for low risk and early discharge, the EDEX was 96.1% sensitive and 61.1% specific. Specificity is fairly high and represents the main selling point. More patients going home is good. However, the article covers a litany of limitations and bits of pieces relevant for the use of EDEX in your practice, the least of which is substantial heterogeneity between studies, heterogeneity between assays used in the studies, and likely higher sensitivity in the Australasian studies as compared to the North American ones. The lens through which clinicians approach patients with chest pain is vastly different overseas, given different resourcing restrictions. Then there is also likely a substantial component. Compo- <clears throat> Then there is also likely a substantial component to overdiagnosis influencing some of the endpoint measurement in North American studies. But all told, yes, this is probably a useful supplement to your gestalt and is likely not clinically different than using the heart zero to three as a structured tool. Yeah, it's it's a fairly involved score that one has to wonder if you're not just taking a history doing a clinical exam and making a clinical decision by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, it, it requires a calculator. It requires a calculator. And, I, you know, that one of the, you know, the, the defining features of a good clinical decision rule is it's simple and can be done fairly easily in the emergency department. I'm not sure this score passes that standard. I would say that it is because we do. <laughs> <laughs> but you, it takes a few seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, like most ones, it hasn't really been compared to, you know, unstructured clinical judgment to see if it truly is better. And I would imagine since it essentially is quantifying unstructured clinical judgment in totality, it probably wouldn't perform much better than, than unstructured clinical judgment. It's hard to say because that study hasn't been done and this uh, meta-analysis doesn't address that specifically. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so if you're going to, it's just another tool to be familiar with that probably sounds a lot like your own clinical judgment and I, I don't uh, foresee it having much uptake in North America, to put it mildly. No. I, I mean, the other thing is with the high sensitivity troponins taking over, you know, if you have a negative high sensitivity troponin, do you really need an, a remainder of your decision rule? Most study would argue no. I would argue that even on the fourth generation with a negative fourth generation uh, troponin, you probably don't need much of a decision rule if, if you have a, a, you know, a three hour troponin that's completely negative. So I'll tell you how we do actually use this is that, Patients with a low score or low risk score get one single troponin in the emergency department regardless of time of onset and they go home. If they have a higher score, then they get potentially 
two negative troponins in the department before going home, unless sure. they are assessed by cardiologists actually requiring some sort of admission for an intervention angiogram or something like that. But you know, obviously, we're in a you know, public healthcare system where resources are limited, so the the preference is to let people go home if it's safe to do so. That's kind of funny. That's so similar to what I do when an unstructured. If I'm somewhat concerned, I get two troponins. If I'm not very concerned, I do a single troponin. So we should have a randomized controlled trial of all these different tools against Rory's clinical gestalt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that'll get funding. <laughs> it'll be generalizable to one person. <laughs> all right. So our next article, elevated blood pressures are common in the emergency department, but are they important? A retrospective cohort of 30,270 adults. And the lead author is Finlay McAllister. The importance of asymptomatic hypertension in the emergency department is a heavily debated topic. I think it has become clear that the emergent treatment of numbers is not required. What exactly do we do with these patients? How quickly do they require referral? And how many of them actually have hypertension on follow? These authors conducted a retrospective analysis of administrative and electronic medical records for all adults treated and released from a large volume emergency department in 2016 that were linked to the administrative records for all healthcare encounters in the province for two years before and after the index ED visit. So obviously this was done in a functional healthcare system, this one being Canada, where you actually had good follow-up on your patient. They identified adult patients with triage blood pressures greater than or equal to 140 over 90. They stratified patients into 140 to 159 or 90 to 99 diastolic, 160 to 179, or 100 to 109 diastolic, and 180 and above or above 110 diastolic. Overall, they examined 30,278 patients that were treated in the emergency department and discharge. Of these, a little over 14,000 or 48% had elevated blood pressure readings at triage. About two thirds of these patients had no prior history of hypertension. The emergency attending physicians rarely prescribed antihypertensive medications. About 2.1% of the patients got antihypertensive at discharge. Of the patients with elevated blood pressure in the emergency department, 70% had were followed up as an outpatient within a month, and 31% of them had an antihypertensive medication prescribed at that time. Of the 10,000 or so patients without a prior history of, of hypertension who had elevated blood pressure during their index visit, about 65% followed up, and only about 13.9% were actually prescribed a hypertensive agent within the next 90 days after their initial ED visit. Patients without a history of hypertension, but with blood pressures greater than 160 over 100, were more likely to meet the composite outcome of transient ischemic attack, acute coronary syndrome, or, or heart failure in the subsequent year, 3.3% versus 2.5%, although that risk was non-significant when it was adjusted for other important confounding variables, such as diabetes, atrial fibrillation, history of cardiovascular disease, age, so on and so forth. So I think this study certainly has its limitations. It was a large retrospective study. It does demonstrate the futility of treating patients' blood pressure in the ED. Only about one-third of the patients with elevated blood pressure in the ED go on to requiring blood pressure medicine in the following months. Yes, the likelihood of patients requiring treatment downstream does get higher as the levels of hypertension in the emergency department go up, but even in the group with systolic blood pressures greater than 180, only about 50% of them went on to require antihypertensive medications downstream. Furthermore, when the authors controlled for confounders, there didn't seem to be any increased risk for downstream negative outcomes for these elevated blood pressures. What this means is an elevated blood pressure in the ED should likely stimulate a follow-up appointment with the patient's primary care provider, but otherwise should not be acted upon. Yeah, it's almost like the emergency department's not the real world, you know, that people are in a stressful, unique medical emergency <laughs> of sort, you know, in the emergency department. And there's a reason why your blood pressure goes up in response to stimuli, as opposed to, you know, out in the ambulatory world where they get their blood pressure checked and you, you know, or your, your standard resting blood pressure and your daily life. And we can see here very clearly within the limitations, but a nice large population data set anyways, that people with just a bit of mild hypertension in the emergency department just don't go on to have bad outcomes the same way that people who with previous ambulatory measures of elevated blood pressure do. There's just no reason to act on blood pressure, elevated blood pressure readings in the emergency department, other than to say, well, it was high today. 
you know, the next time you're at your, you know, your doctor's office, you know, mention that you had a high blood pressure measurement in the emergency department and make sure that they check it. Yeah. And uh, the futility is even worse than this, right? Because, you know, you're going to be wrong a lot of the time. They're not going to have high blood pressure. But even the ones that do have high blood pressure, it doesn't matter if you treat them in the ED if they don't have follow up with their primary care provider and get treatment then. And if they do have follow up with their primary care provider, it doesn't matter what you do in the emergency department. Exactly. <laughs> we shouldn't even measure blood pressure in the emergency department. I've tried that. I've tried to get that across. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard task to accomplish. We shouldn't even measure it. That was one of my proposals. Uh, unfortunately, it ends up being like the, the most important feature for all our sepsis machine learning models. But uh, <laughs> so you have to measure it or else the machine learning models won't work. <laughs> Sure, but if, if the patient presents with a sprained ankle, do they need their blood pressure measured? Probably not. No. <laughs> but somehow it's impossible to have that happen. Oh, well. If you have a chest, you get an EKG. If you have an arm, you get your blood pressure measured. <laughs> All right. So our last article for this month is called When Safety Event Reporting is Seen as Punitive. The quote, I've been PSN'd. And our lead author here is Ramana Fieser. And they are at the Virginia Commonwealth University. I would probably say that most, if not all, institutions have some mechanism for quality improvement and patient safety reporting. This typically takes the form of some sort of submission, anonymous or otherwise, in which potential safety events can be submitted for review. In theory, the goal of these submissions is care improvement, identification of systemic risks or individual knowledge gaps, and is ideally framed in a positive fashion to forward-looking improve the outcomes for patients. Of course, sometimes it doesn't feel like someone is out to help you improve, and rather there is a punitive element to the reporting. This is an evaluation of 513 patient safety network reports submitted in 2019 at a single system for factors that could be perceived as punitive, which is to say that could be perceived as trying to get the recipient in trouble. <laughs> Three emergency physician leaders of the PSN system reviewed each complaint and, using a structured coding schema, tried to characterize the differences between those PSNs which could be perceived as punitive and those which were perceived as non-punitive. Overall, and with fairly good inter-rater agreement, 25% of PSNs could be perceived as punitive. Their specific coding schema identified a few primary differences between the punitive and the non-punitive safety reports, with punitive reports more frequently containing communication breakdowns, employee behavior issues, and acute patient assessment issues. A few examples are given, and they're sort of the so-called, sort of, we called someone for a procedure and there were unacceptable delays, or... I got blindsided by someone who was sicker than I expected, and no one had escalated the problem appropriately prior to my evaluation. And these represent just a small percentage of the punitive cases, but it still exceeds those of the non-punitive nature. Roland Fairbanks from MedStar Health writes a brief editorial accompanying this article, basically saying that the punitive language in patient safety reports represents a rotten safety culture. The language is not the cause of the poor culture, but a symptom of such and should prompt leaders to examine how the patient safety mechanism is functioning and perceived within the institution. Yeah, I, I think this is a really good attempt to like quantify something I'm sure we've all felt where this PSN system is used in bad faith and used to, to achieve goals that it's not intended for. I think it's a really hard thing to do, and they did a fairly good job at it, though I, I would imagine even they were unable to quantify the true extent of this, right? Like because a lot of these a lot of these aren't always made in good faith and they simply are to get someone in trouble, especially in a culture where PSNs have become this kind of cludgeon on which you kind of punish people with rather than what they're intended, which is to improve care. I think that's the, the thing you have to look at is is are your PSNs actually helping the care of patients or are they simply you know, creating a, a toxic work environment. And that's a difficult thing to evaluate. So I wouldn't even say that this necessarily accurately represents the uh, precise amount of punitive versus non-punitive reports, even at this single center. But it's illustrative about how 
each institution should probably go back and sort of look at the patient safety network reports that they're getting as some sort of an indication of how well or whether it's being how well it's actually serving its goals or whether it's being weaponized and there needs to be sort of a transformational intervention to make sure that the that everybody is acting in the best interest of patients or rather than acting in the best interests of you know perhaps other motives i would take another step further i don't think the PSN systems or these safety reporting systems have ever been shown to improve outcomes. I mean, <laughs> certainly that's a, probably true. And, you know, there are tons of unintended consequences of this. The, the most notably is what these authors are mm, That escalated quickly. <laughs> From <laughs> PSNs are sometimes punitive to PSNs are garbage. There has to be some. I guess it's, it's the face validity is that, you know, if you report systemic problems, then you're going to probably get uh, some solutions. But you're right. If you want to actually randomize, uh, I'm not sure how you would construct a trial to evaluate the efficacy of PSNs. I guess you could put every other PSN into a black box and see if, you know, something like that. Let's see. If they're, if they're not responded to or. Yeah. Or, or yeah, you, you randomize. Um, yeah. To, to systems, whether they're actually, you know, just put in and, and, and they go nowhere or they actually go to hmm. some administrative system. You randomize hospitals uh, and see if outcomes improve. But, yeah. then, but then there are a lot of people be out uh, of a job. Yeah, I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's part of the point, right? Like, you know, in order for PSNs to actually have a positive outcome, people have to look at it from a system based approach. And so often it's not so often it's looked at an individual approach, this individual made a mistake, and, and how are we gonna, you know, fix this individual from mistake rather than what is the system that led to this mistake, which is, you know, ideally, what would be done if, 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 if uh, you know, patient reporting safety issues were actually um, mm -hmm. to be. Effective. So yeah, it's gonna depend. It's gonna be, but that's gonna be difficult to generalize between institutions, of course. So because each institution has its own different culture, it's, it's probably really reasonable to say that uh, a lot of institutions have probably lost their way as far as whether their safety culture is tilting towards punitive versus non-punitive. Yeah, I would like to see this this analysis kind of repeated in other places to see if it's externally valid. Because I thought this was a really nice way of quantifying something I think we've all kind of qualitatively been aware of. All right. So that wraps us up for another month. Until next time. Uh, any comments, questions, or concerns, we can be reached at annalsaudio at asep.org. Until next month, this was Rory Spiegel and Ryan Redecki, and this was the Annals of Emergency Medicine Podcast.